name be basically in Spanish. To me, as director of NTN24, the Spanish uh, news channel, bringing together journalists, people who love uh, this uh, activity, thinkers, leaders, idea creators of regional integration, to be able to share with you people with whom we are able to conduct uh, consultations, others with whom are having a, a contact with for the first time. To thank CAF, the Inter-American Dialogue, indeed, for this invitation to moderate over this panel session, which is indeed very interesting and I hope will be highly um, enriching to all of us. We will change the format a little bit. We'll try to bring about um, questions addressed to the speakers to see if we can carry out the miracle of extending our time a little bit, although the time is always as an enemy after us. Uh, I would like to introduce the panelists that will be sharing this hour and a half with us. We start with Mar Marco Aurelio Garcia. As you acknowledge, he is the foreign policy advisor to the president of Brazil, President Dilma uh, Rousseff. He had this position also during the government of Lula da Silva, the former president of Panama, Martin Torrijos. Great pleasure to meet you here. We lived in Panama, but we come and meet here in, in Washington. Our uh, former uh, foreign minister, Minister of Education, Maria Emma Mejia, Secretary General of the UNASUR, which is the the Union of South American Nations, and also to welcome Thomas McClarty, who is the president of McClarty and Associates, international consultancy um, firm um, dealing with uh, communication media, and we constantly consult their viewpoints and ideas with regard to all subjects having to do with Latin America and the USA. And lastly, our eternal uh, interviewee, Mr. Jose Miguel Insulza, Secretary of the OAS, always submitted to this uh, questioning, not before TV cameras, but surrounded by the, the panels and members, uh, f member friends of this panel. Uh, we'll be dealing with the hemispheric uh, challenges. 20 years after the first summit of the Americas, the first summit of the Americas, which was a very concrete inspiration, um, the 34 democratic countries in the hemisphere um, decided to discuss an idea that was submitted as a dream at that point in time, the dream of the free trade area for the Americas called ALCA. Um, it was a dream like many others for the promoters from the US of A and other enthusiastic countries in Latin America. It uh, opened up the possibility to work so that someday we would be free of barriers and borders, having an in-depth and permanent integration where the human person, according to this idea, would be free in order to produce, to sell, and purchase in a comprehensive integrated market. This generated a whole deal of expectation of political integration, the strengthening of democratic processes, and it was put forth as a panacea, a great idea to combat um, the problems affecting Latin America, such as inequality and backwardness. On the other hand, that wonderful dream, which was inspired by the Summit of the Americas, to others it was interpreted as a true nightmare. Countries were going to come uh, from the north with very strong economies, the U.S. and Canada, and this would impinge on the smaller economies, much weaker in the south, turning them into, into economies that were in very weak uh, states, having in unstable democracies in many instances, having policies of economic uh, uh, models that would not allow for a true control of markets. So there was a tremendous opposition also to that idea, to that uh, idea. After the Summit of the Americas, the issue of ALCA uh, was uh, postponed, was left on the side, and we will see whether we see a certain degree of maturity to go back to that idea at some point in time. That's what we'll be discussing with the analysts who make up this panel this afternoon. Anyway, I'd like to highlight a concrete point of fact. During the uh, various panel sessions that we have been hearing and analyzing since yesterday, uh,
challenges have been mentioned uh, from the economic standpoint. How is it that a region that uh, has grown over 20 years, uh, since that first uh, summit of the Americas continued to grow economically, since we overcame many problems of poverty, the middle class grew with uh, important demands. As uh, the Secretary of SEGIP, Enrique Iglesias, told us a while ago, and a whole series of uh, advances of which we feel very proud as Latin Americans. But with regard, and with regard to this economic uh, advancement, there is a question mark in the case of the middle classes. How much have we strengthened our democracy together with that economic growth? How much have we strengthened democratic institutions? And how much have we bolstered? the influence of these democratic values and practice, including civil rights, freedoms, <coughs> right to expressing opinions uh, freely, to voice uh, our political stances. We see that there are many sectors and governments which are perhaps uh, threatening our democracies at uh, this point in time to build and continue conducting this promotion because our democracies are far from being perfect. Throughout these 20 years, likewise, we've seen the birth of uh, several sub-regional groups uh, as opposed to that great dream inspired by the Summit of the Americas, having different visions of um, economic models, different approaches with regard to the political models and with an ideology. There is a whole discourse and a rhetoric and a constant contradiction as regards these political ideas and uh, all that which has to do with these paradigms and how they're analyzed and how the growth of countries is analyzed from each and every country. There is an ideologic antagonism in our region at this point in time. I'd like to begin uh, with uh, addressing uh, Jose Miguel Insulza, Secretary General of the OAS. You've been criticized and you say that you are not the one who makes the decisions. Decisions are made by governments. Do you believe that as a region, Mr. Insulza, do we agree or are we like neighbors in a building who do not withstand one another, but we have to tolerate one another, notwithstanding this. Yes, with much pleasure, uh, moderator. This, this is the position you have submitted, which is a way of looking at the continent, indeed, uh, which I share in certain aspects, but not in others. Uh, first of all, the Summit of the Americas was not made up just for the sake of free trade. The first Summit of the Americas was an invitation made by President Clinton to discuss, among other things, the commercial issues and uh, trade. But it goes beyond that, also dealing with all those problems which in one way or the other are a matter of concern to the presidents and heads of state of the region. This is what I say. Uh, it is not so much uh, that issue presented in the summit. The first summit of the Americas had to do with uh, free trade, true, but also the decision of the negotiation uh, groups uh, came up in Chile, the second summit, which they, where they started dealing with education. The summit used to deal with uh, science and technology as well, but there were opportunities and there was a whole atmosphere in the region in this regard. Democratization process had taken place in most countries, and there was a time to launch a great initiative such as the Latin American uh, Charter. Uh, also in the summit of Trinidad and Tobago, where we saw that other issues and crises came up. Um, success was obtained, but what to do with the crisis which was just around the corner? And the Cartagena summit, let us not forget, was where we launched the discussion on a subject that had been postponed, which is that of drugs, even though there were other subjects too. In any case, I don't know what will happen in Panama, what the subject there will be. But I hope that in Panama, we will be dealing with subjects or issues that are the Latin Americans are facing today which is that of social inclusion and inequality. The fact that we have recovered democracy, that we have some growth, but we are still the most unequal continent in the world. That's what summits are for, not only for one thing or one purpose or one subject to speak of free trade, for instance. As for integration, and succinctly, I believe that the fact is that subject is not binary, where you say it works or it doesn't work. There's alcohol or it doesn't, or there isn't. There's free trade or not, no. The progress 
of this hemisphere as far as insertion in the world economy is great. It's not enough, but agreements signed, for instance, between the United States and Canada with many countries in Latin America, that is important. Agreements that exist within the regions, agreements such as Mercosur or the Pacific Alliance, they all open markets and open up to integration throughout the world. And this has not necessarily been done in an orderly fashion. We have not all sat around a table and reached the same agreement, but the region is incre increasingly included in the world economy. Of course, integration is not is more than free trade. And integration, and I've said so often, this is not new, well, the Americas is the continent of subregions, and of course, the four subregions that exist today, as far as integration, economic integration is concerned, they are not compartmentalized. It's not that they don't cross one another, but still, we have North America, Central America, the Caribbean, and South America, and South America has finally re gone uh, to UNASUR. Well, we'll speak about that, but it does not mean that that spoke that that began yesterday. We have Mercosur, the Pacific Alliance, so we all. We have these different alliances and partnerships that have become part of the hemisphere. Now, that integration means economic integration. That is true. I don't believe in solely an exclusive political integration. Latin Americans often think that in order not to speak of the elimination of tariffs and of barriers, then we should speak of chains of value, of common currency, etc. Yes. Chains of value and common currency is important, but we also have to resolve the enormous tariff problems that we still face in this region that does not trade sufficiently within the region itself. What does this require? Well, first of all, we have to think that we're not all the same. We cannot. What is the magic of European integ integration, in spite of its failings, that the poorest countries have benefited in order to be able to trade? The countries with, that are more important and larger from the economic point of view give certain benefits to smaller countries. We don't have preferential systems, but in ALCA we thought that integration would be the same for everyone, equal for everyone, but we don't have sub-regional institutions. We can speak of all kinds of institutions, but the only way to solve problems are by calling telephones among presidents. That is presidents calling each other with telephone. We don't have a true solution of dispute institution. But in any case, I wanted to repeat that integration is not only a question of free trade. Integration must require, at least for a while, that the regions of the continent come together. It is a complex phenomenon. Since a lot has been said about democracy, I can also reply to the next question, but I have said enough. Well, I wanted to ask, from the point of view of the United States, vis-a-vis -vis Latin America, how close or far are we from, from going to a true regional, hemispheric, and comprehensive integration, or should we forget about it? And what do you think about the role played by Barack Obama in this integration? He has been very criticized by the Latin Americans. They even say that Barack Obama is more interested in Africa than in Latin America. What do you think about that? Well, first of all, uh, let me uh, build on Secretary General Consulza's comments. Uh, but before, before I do that, uh, let me say I'm very uh, honored and pleased to be part of, the, of this program. Can you hear me all right now? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And I appreciate your accommoda accommodating my southern accent as well. <laughs> <laughs> and let me assure you with this distinguished panel, some of whom I have known and worked with over the years and seeing so many good friends, uh, there is uh, more than a mutuality of respect here with neighbors. It's easy to do. Uh, Enrique, it's good to see you. Congratulations on your continued leadership. Michael Schiffer, the same for the dialogue where I've been pleased to be a board member for many years. I think Jose Miguel had it just right, uh, having the opportunity and privilege to be part of the first Summit of the Americas in 1994, a number of years ago, I might add, approaching 20. It really was much broader than just trade and integration, as important as that was. 
the real impetus of any trade agreement or foreign direct investment take, take it off. Oh, is, uh, is, is really to help improve the lives of the citizens of the country. So the first summit was a real uh, effort to have an architecture in place, if you will, for hemispheric relations to build and sustain and support the changes that were taking place within the region in terms of democracies and all of the technology that was coming into play during that period. And I think the Secretary General had it right, uh, having the privilege to be part of the second summit of the Americas, if you walked us down memory lane there, uh, in Chile. It mm -hmm. was, I think, very logically focused on education. Uh, let us work on in production. Something is happening. Can you hear me now? Yes. I have experience in this. La cuestión era. A full service no. moderator. <laughs> Uh, but I think uh, it logically. <laughs> <laughs> no, go on, go on. Yeah. Put it up. Just, yeah, maybe you put it up on the. Well, the let's just do it this way. Does that work? No. <laughs> uh, no. I think we have to change this mic, please. Sorry. Uh, we'll that <laughs> let's go to commercials. Well, let me. Uh, Vamos a ver. Well, let me just see if I can talk loud. The other mic. The headset. Y se nos va a empezar a traer después. Bueno, well, hopefully this is not here. Ah, no. Ok. Thank you. I think uh, the progression of the summit has been very logical as you led up to Cartagena. In terms of integration in the region, uh, I would agree that the expectations were very high for the ALCA, and those were not fully achieved. However, there's many people here in the private sector, and without question, integration in terms of trade and investment have dramatically increased since the first summit of the Americas, almost three times. As I've said so many times, Latin America is a natural market for the United States, but not one that can or should be taken for granted. So I think in, in looking at the region itself, uh, to me, the summit of the Americas has fulfilled much of its promise, not all, much more work to be done, but in terms of establishing a, a much stronger partnership and understanding, and clearly the region and the countries, as the Secretary General outlined, have evolved and changed significantly over the past two decades, as has the shape of, <coughs> of the international and world economy. Now, for President Obama, I would very much uh, respond that I think the president, whom I've had the privilege to, to know and, and work with in a, a modest way, has been very much engaged in the region uh, John Feely, my good friend, is here uh, with uh, Roberta Jacobson, have, have lead that effort with both Secretary Clinton as well as Secretary Kerry. And I think by any measurement on any of the issues, whether they're opportunities or challenges, uh, this administration has built on prior administrations, both Republicans and Democrats, in terms of the engagement with the region. Now, it's a pretty complicated world these days, and there clearly are other demands and priorities. But if any of you, and what many of you were, in Cartagena at the summit there, uh, where President Obama spoke with President Santos, President uh, Dilma there, 
no one could doubt that he was engaged, understood the issues. This was in the private sector of the business session before the actual formal summit of the Americas. And of course, you have the growing uh, Latino influence in our country, politically and economically. Uh, and, and that's a major factor. So there are many issues and many problems to confront. But overall, I think the architecture of the summit is in place. And I think uh, the summit that's coming up, Mr. President, in Panama in the future uh, will be a very good one. I want to continue now with Marco Aurelio. Finally, the countries that became part of the summit were the 34 democratic countries, excluding Cuba then. They are the member countries of the OAS. And so we are brought together also by Democratic Charter. You, who worked with Lula Silva and also worked with him in the idea of creating UNASUR and proposing that to the countries of the region, why did you feel that there was that need for a new organization different from the OAS? Because the OAS and its Democratic Charter and Democratic values you felt were inadequate. Why did you think there was we needed another sub-regional agency that would bring together the countries of the South. Well, first of all, thank you for your presence here and for the way in which you're leading this discussion. I would like to say that in addition to Tom, that I didn't know, I didn't know Jose Miguel well and my, and the former Secretary General of UNASUR and with my friend, Mr. Torrijos. It, this is an important discussion. I have a professional failing. I am a former professor of history. For, two, for 12 years, I have not been in my profession. But when I was invited to come to this session, I thought of preparing a presentation where I could tell you not necessarily the history of the summits, but the history of the world and Latin America that led to us being able to have different types of summits. So to a certain extent, and to reply specifically to your question, but I want to go actually beyond that, UNASUR is not a competitor to the OAS. It's as if we were saying that the OAS is a competitor of the UN. No, it's simply a bit like these Russian dolls that one is inside the other, you know, the nesting dolls. And each one has its own specificity and each one its own charm. Now. The thing is that if we think about the key question of a historical reconstitution and of the ideological and political environment of 20 years ago, Gardel used to say that 20 years is nothing, but it is a lot, both for the world and for the region. If we look back to the atmosphere, to the political atmosphere 20 years ago, we can see why there were so many changes during this period and why UNASUR came about at that time. Even before the summits, we already had Khan, we had Mercosur, and still it did not seem that they were in conflict with the OAS. Now, what is the problem? The summit of 1994 began in an environment where the subject of free trade was the subject and it was submitted as a universal panacea. And this had to do with a number of things, because it was the end of the Cold War. There was a crisis with the Soviet model, a crisis with social democracy that was going in another direction than its original direction, and capitalism that existed then, because we often speak about socialism. But the existing capitalism seemed to be the great conqueror. And there was just one model, one idea. But in any case, in that environment, in that scenario, that's where the idea came up of setting up a free trade area for the Americas. For some, it was a dream. I was in the region of the nightmare. And that's why many of our countries and many more rejected the ALCA project, the FTAA project in Mar del Plata. Now, what happened? It wasn't actually an ideological rejection, even though there was some of that. All our life is, of course, permeated by ideology on both sides. It wasn't a rejection of that type, though. It was a 
interpretation of that time, an interpretation of the new era that showed that integration, and Jose Miguel said that too, that integration, well, he didn't emphasize it the way I did, but that the integration could not depend so much on free trade. And as a matter of fact, I think it will depend decreasingly on free trade, not only on free trade, but on trade in general. UNASUR arose because we realized that at that time, when we set it up, we had four different trade regimes in South America. We had Mercosur, and many who were not interested in, the, in Mercosur as a trade regime began attending Mercosur meetings anyway. To a certain extent, it was a precedent for UNASUR. We had the Andean community, which was a bit perforated at that time. We had CARICOM, and we had Chile, which at that time was developing its own free trade project with the United States and other countries. So our question was, why do we have to be so far one from the other? Why is it that our only alternative is to ask Chileans to increase their tariffs or that the Chileans ask us to reduce our tariffs if we can have other types of integration? And we realized that the key question here is that Latin America is becoming, especially on the basis of new phenomena that began in the 21st century, it is becoming and converting into a new reality because the economic policies in various countries were truly bringing about social changes. It's true that we're still a very unequal region, but we were much more unequal before than what we're now. And these unequal policies or these policies of, that seek equality were not part of the project of some of the international organizations. Of course, they were thinking about poverty and how do we solve poverty and let us do something to prevent poverty. But we wanted, we had a vast social project which happened in Brazil, Uruguay, Colombia, Chile, etc. So what was the idea then? The idea was for us to set up a new economic model based basically on the creation of a consumer good, a domestic, an internal domestic and regional consumer goods market. And in the case of South America, it's a market of 400 million people, people that would stop being a demographic datum and be truly something important. And we did this by maintaining macroeconomic balance, by reducing external vulnerability, which was a major problem where our countries, because our countries had enormous debts, and in a democratic framework. Democratic framework that is different in each country. But I'm not one of those who says, one country is more democratic or another one is less democratic and giving certificates of democracy. But that was the change. And we discovered that the major problems we had were not the commercial and economic difficulties. Our difficulties had to do with a very low link among our countries. It was easier to go to Miami than to travel amongst our countries in South America. So we had a need for physical integration of energy integration. That's a great paradox. South America appeared as the region with the greatest energy potential in the world. Still in many countries, we had blackouts. So we had to connect our countries. And we also had a problem, which I think is still a modern problem, and that is that of productive integration. And I think that productive integration allows us to get away from the old integration methods because all trade integration alone is very often asymmetrical. And it is not only asymmetrical for many of the Latin American countries vis-a-vis -vis the United States. It's also asymmetrical within South America. If we were to have an integration only based on trade in South America, Brazil would be the big winner. 
because we have a much bigger economy, a more complex economy. We can export hundreds or thousands of products, and many countries can only export two, three, four, or 10 products. So that is not advisable, because we should not have just one rich country in integration, in economic integration with smaller countries and unequal countries. So we cannot think only of other types of integration. And to conclude, I would like to say that with that in mind, we should look towards the integration processes that we saw in Asia, where they seek for complementarity. But in order to have complementarity, we need a physical energy as well as a financial integration. Thank you. Now, let us speak about the last America Summit and about the next America Summit with Mariama and Martin, because since Mariama is, Mariama, sorry, is Colombian, and the last one was in Panama, from the lessons of the last summit, we can speak about the challenges of the next summit. During the last summit, Mariema, there was a difficult moment in, I mean, in being able to convene everyone because there was the issue of Cuba. When Manuel Santos, the president of Colombia, did sort of like a triple mortal jump to be able to convince the ALBA countries that if Cuba did not attend the summit, the, Q, the summit would not break down and that the ALBA countries attend. We should recall how this situation was handled and what lessons can we learn from that last uh, summit with regard to the future summit. Thank you to our hosts. It's been five years that I've been attending this uh, type of intensive seminar on our region and integration process. What is surprising of that summit is that not only did the subject of Cuba come up, but also the subject of drugs, which is the most important step that has been taken, and that now we can work on that subject, which is a subject that is cross-cutting throughout the hemisphere. But in addition, supposedly because no declaration came out of that summit. It's the first one of all of the summits where there's been no declaration, so people said it was a failed summit. However, President Santos summarized the summit very well. He spoke about the fact that these summits, what they allow us to do is not only to come and speak about what brings us together, but especially to speak about our contradictions and our differences. And I think that that has been the spirit not only in this mechanism of integration and in the Cartagena summit, but even within UNASUR or within MERCOSUR or within ALBA or within the Pacific Alliance or CELAC, all of these mechanisms that one says, well, listen, this vice of Latin American integration, how long will it last? But let us think also of the Summit of the Americas because to a certain extent, it's a decision on integration that allows us to build, even though we have such great differences, economic, trade, asymmetries, and including cultural difference. Who would believe it? But in our region, there are many cultural differences, too. So the Cartagena Summit, I think, was an important keystone where I agree with Mr. McLarkley, where President Obama was at all the working sessions. He personally participated because sometimes some presidents withdrew for a while because these were complex and long sessions. And President Obama participated. He truly came to us. It was not easy to listen to all these complaints that actually, well, existed more in the past than now. I think there's a more homogeneous and relationship of equal to equal. It used to be the, this relationship of inequality with the United States, I think, is past us. And the subject of Cuba rose as a conclusion of that summit, saying that there can be no other summit of the Americas in Panama and April if we don't invite Cuba as a country of the Americas. And that decision was made, was adopted at the Cartagena summit. and. President Varela 
and the vice president and foreign minister have expressed that, that Cuba is now in formal process of being invited to a summit that has to do with the first one, because we're going back to the subject of sustainable development and of social justice for the Americas, a subject that is recurrent in our discussions. And now I would like to speak about the social area. But as for the drugs, I would like to say that Jose Miguel Insulza with the OAS, it was entrusted by the chiefs of state and heads of government to analyze, as never had been done, to assess the problem of drugs. And I think that that is very important. Within this new mentality, and Robert or Jacobson mentioned that yesterday, he was saying that the war of drugs or war on drugs, that term does not exist in our hemisphere. That terminology stopped existing and even the President and Department of State and the policy and effort made by drafting this document that assessed and developed possibilities for solving the problem that was led by Jose Miguel Insulza. And after that, by the way, we had the special assembly of Guatemala. And now on September 19th, we will be seeing something that is truly revolutionary. We were working on that, on the new resolution for the special session on drugs. And there we can see that there is a very different perspective and vision of an element that led us to confrontation and a war. At that time, we did call it a war. Let us recall what Colombia lived through and what other countries have lived through and how difficult that made our relations, our diplomatic and political relations with some other countries. So there, there's a certain kind of convergence and vision where we're trying to find the differences in order to look at the positive elements and build on those differences. On September 19th at the UN, we will also see the report of the World Drug Commission, the second report after 2011, where several of our former presidents ended up being part of that panel, of that group of experts. And it is truly something revealing. And it is consistent with the document to be submitted by the UN. This is then a new path. And this has a lot to do with the subject of social justice, too. We have said ad infinitum here that if this hemisphere, because it is not only a problem for Latin America and the Caribbean, it is also an issue for the hemisphere in general due to the huge inequities that we have in the educational area and in building and developing human capital, especially for Hispanics and Latins in the United States. So that process where we see a general common vision that we have to produce that exchange of which Ocampo spoke this morning, that we have to find new possibilities of training human capital and truly enrich ourselves as Asia did. Marco Aurelio mentioned that where it allowed it to reach the present point of economic development. Well, let's not forget in any case that we still have 150 million poor people. We say we have managed to bring in one third of the Latin Americans into the middle class and the challenges that ha has confronted or brought up, but we still have profound inequality and poverty. But the valuable thing here, I think, is that whatever we call it, one way or the other, we're not competing to see which is the best integration mechanism. There are a number of them. Let us use all of them and let us take the best advantage of our differences. And in April in Panama, I think we will be have we would see this thread. Well, Panama, this small country that brings us together because of its, the Panama Canal, I think that will be the place and time where we will be able to face the difficult challenge where we see is the United States going to attend or not? Is Canada going to attend or not? Because Cuba will be there. But it is an important challenge, and I think that all of us have work to do in that area. In the last summit, that was the answer given by the host, Juan Manuel Santos, that he received from the US administration and Canadian administration. We attend to summits where there are democratic countries, especially if that summit has been convened by democratic 
countries from the beginning. When you extend this uh, invitation today, and I'm sure that nobody knows, nobody thinks that Raul Castro will lose that opportunity. But what do you expect of the U.S. reaction? How are you expecting to convince the USA for its president Barack Obama to truly attend that summit next year? I, I believe that, uh, and I will make a little spot here. Uh, uh, that was uh, the, in the Miami summit was my first meeting as a vice minister. And of course, uh, as Marco Aurelio said, the formulation had to do basically with uh, trade and commerce. But there were also issues regarding security, and it was part of the activities of the Ministry of the Interior. But as regards uh, the uh, Panama summit, hopefully that will be the summit where it will be shown that in this continent, we may indeed prove that the unity, there might be unity within diversity, and that the US as well as Cuba be present, not as a success by any specific group, but as a collective triumph where we may unify and bring together the entire continent, including Cuba, with the attendance of the USA, especially since the summits, as was stated by Secretary Insulza a while ago, Eventually, what they have to seek out is to resolve problems. Summits are not there to accuse alleged uh, people or countries guilty for anything. Summits are for us to seek out solution to common problems by sharing our experience, particularly at a point in time where our continent is going through tremendous uncertainty, where we see, as was clearly explained today, a new economic uh, map worldwide where there is a need for an opportunity to actually rethink what is this new model of development with social justice and equity, and how is it that these summits may truly serve in order to promote those challenges for greater productivity and uh, productive uh, uh, linkages that might take place in Latin America. What can we do so that in the case of Central America, we may truly have uh, a greater physical integration, such as the electrical integration, which goes from Panama to Guatemala, and which should work also from Panama, not only toward Guatemala, but also toward Mexico, including Colombia as well. And this is taking place at a crucial moment for Panama, where after 100 years of the opening of the canal, and after showing the bargaining capabilities among different uh, positions, and Mark was experienced as regards the negotiation of the Panama Canal Treaty with President Carter and my father, uh, and we realized that in spite of the great differences and difficulties we encounter throughout time, when it, it comes to making justice, we can reach an agreement. We overcame all the differences, and we can now commemorate the 100 years of the canal, the 30 years, which will be on September 7, of the signing of the treaties, and that we may show the entire world that Latin America is capable of conducting large infrastructural projects at a moment where they are called for to improve competitiveness in a region that will have a good economic growth and which requires for this new re-engineering and political will. And what a best, what a better opportunity to have all the presidents of our continent get together and be present to discuss these matters, which uh, call for a commitment going beyond the minister ministerial level, but a commitment by all states, which I hope will be reached in this little bridge, Panama, in order to join this diversity that might exist in the American Do you think that Cuba will attend the uh, summit? Yes, I, I do think they will because I think this will be the opportunity to unify and bring unity among in diversity. This will not be an individual success of any group or country, but the collective triumph of all of the Americas. Yes, this will be open to all. I think that after what we lived yesterday and the panel session we had on Cuba, which was uh, highly enriching and which showed us, as a point of fact, very interesting processes taking place, I believe that uh, the uh, decision 20 years ago, of course, circumstances were quite different from the <coughs> domestic U.S. policy to what they are today. And uh, I think that uh, 
uh, uh, having Martin Torrijos, this would be a truly historic opportunity so that at the end of Obama's administration, that that uh, uh, fact, uh, that historical and political landmark could be attained. We have been discussing throughout these two days uh, the challenges having to do with economic integration as well as the challenge dealing with the issues of doing away with uh, inequalities in Latin America. All of you, the experts and analysts, continue to state it. We cannot continue to impose such a broad quota of inequality and poverty in Latin America. But I want to ask you to tell me very candorously, very clearly, where do we place the role of democracy as a, a, a hemispheric challenge? And I would like for all of you to respond. Well, I think that we do have um, our ideas in the Americas. More democracy in some places than in others. I know that there are countries which are facing problems. I come from Chile, I will not hide that. But uh, all of you have been, when you refer to Cuba, you say that the summits take place when there are 34 democratic countries. Well, 34 democratic countries have never existed in the history of the Americas, ever. So I think that is indeed a great achievement that has to be reckoned with. Secondly, democracy is a process. It is indeed a process that uh, follows a certain pathway. And uh, there is it goes back and forth. Um, and after the signing of the Inter-American Democratic Charter, we see that there are countries where democracy has forged ahead much more than in others, no doubt. I will not give you any examples, but we know that there are countries where democratic development and the Demo Inter-American Democratic Charter uh, is very important. Uh, we would all like to have democracy. No democracy, perhaps, reaches that top level. But in terms of the Inter-American Democratic Charter, I believe there are countries that have made much more progress. There are countries in where there is greater freedom of expression, countries where the individual uh, human rights are respected. There is a more prevalence of the rule of law and equity. Uh, and the Democratic Charter indeed refers to those concept and something else which is a true reality as well, and which has to do with this historical situation and the way in which the processes have taken place. The fact that some processes that today have a certain authoritarian bias, more authoritarian in some places than other, and this took place of countries that were broken down because the former rulers had put them in a situation of ruin. So I think that uh, democracy has made progress in the Americas, and the pace of progress in different places is different. And saying this in all candor, and considering what the problems are, and in trying to group uh, the problems and reflecting them on a text, uh, on a piece of paper, I found a good piece of work by Guillermo Donnell, who's dead. I don't remember exactly what he said, but he's the first Latin American author who, um, not having a better term, he found something that we all use now, which is the word accountability in English. Guillermo fought um, against dictatorships. He was a builder of democracy, and he was also a critic of democracy. He said that um, uh, our democracies, because of authoritarian legacy and um, the situation which prevails in some countries, tend to be reluctant to accept true accountability. Yes, they do respect the uh, elections. Nobody uh, disrespects democracy. P uh, government rulers are selected democratically. But then why did you do this or why didn't you do that? That is somewhat more difficult to explain. This is why there is a problem with accountability. Some countries have problems regarding freedom of expression and some others problems of the independence of the judiciary and other issues which still show a certain trend, um, perhaps more serious in some places than in others, toward a unipersonal government rather to the build, than the building of institutions. What can we do in this regard? And I say this, and I have stated it since I started, and nine years after, I continue to say the same thing. I think we can no longer speak about intervention in the old sense of the word in Latin America. We cannot intervene in countries. That serves no purpose. That has never been 
useful. What is the option now which is available? Uh, perhaps it's a situation that is slower and so on, but that is cooperation, dialogue, seeking out understanding. When uh, the situation of Venezuela came about, I immediately said the only possible pathway is that of dialogue, the only possible pathway. Has there been dialogue or not? Well, there have been discourses on one side or the other, throwing stones and mud at one another without anyone listening. Some character whom I will not uh, mention now says that in order to be dialogue, one has to be ready to listen rather than to talk. And that problem exists as a point of fact. It is a problem which has not been resolved and that will end up in more serious difficulties than it is undergoing today. But if they tell us that is a difficult pathway, it is risky and dangerous, it hasn't worked, there are people who are still in jail and so on, I say, well, what the only possible option, if there's no dialogue, there's no other possible option, unless there's a political dialogue in a country which is completely divided, where the result of the problem will be that 50% will win and 50% will lose. And when the country, 50% win and 50% lose, that is a true disaster for that nation. So as regards this matter, and since you have been inquiring, I think that the solution lies in dialogue beyond what President Calderon stated yesterday. And this is something that perhaps he didn't say when we was in the administration, and I'm not being critical. Uh, you have to be a former president to address these points. Yasser Arafat said once, uh, when the president of the USA said that there, there was a need to create the Palestinian state, he said, I would be satisfied if there were a president in a country uh, uh, who uh, would say this uh, once it is a, a former president. I think that when we think of the problems uh, uh, something generates uh, in its own country. You have to think of its own people. In the case of Latin America, in all countries, if someone is for the sake of intervention in other countries, everyone will say no. So therefore, our only true way out is the promotion of dialogue on a permanent basis as a means to try to overcome problems of countries. And um, dialogue is necessary for this to happen in countries that have uh, problems uh, with their democracy. With it, with regard to Cuba, I would just like to say a word. Uh, um, an advantage in the original design of uh, summits, and there's still some issues pending, is that the country that organizes in May extends the invitation and determines the agenda. Um, so besides that, I don't think much can be done or nothing much can be discussed. I think the time is over now, and the time is already mature to attempt new possibilities at different levels. The successes in the field of drugs shows that after 40 years of combating and having a war against drugs, suddenly we stop discussing the matter and referring to a war on drugs. And the, mo the greatest progress in the report of OAS, and not because of our f American friends are in this room, is that the greatest progress is that we stop to discuss the issue of drugs. The government of uh, President Obama does not speak about a war against drugs. It speaks about education, about uh, health, etc. But this means that there is a new stance, a new position when realizing that if after 40 years things do not work out, we have to make other attempts. Well, 40 years as isolating Cuba has not worked out. That's all I can argue. Uh, perhaps uh, other possibilities uh, will give us a better result. I think it is important, and um, the fact that uh, Panama calls to do one thing or the other, all I can say is that dating back to the times of President Clinton when we discussed these matters, the fact that the Pope, uh, the Pope is going to Cuba is something that has to be taken advantage of to taken advantage of to produce dialogue, and this actually happened. There are no limitations because we uh, the redacted these, uh, or we drew up these uh, sanctions against Cuba, and I'm not speaking about the Inter-American Democratic Charter, but the Charter of the OAS, which says that all the countries in the Americas that signed this charter are members of the OAS. Cuba did sign the OAS Charter, never has it denounced it, uh, so uh, he is uh, such as any other country and deserves being invited. They have not wanted to come back to OAS. I very much regret it. But if Panama wishes to invite Cuba, this is no, there is no legal objection to it. Yes, indeed, the resolution 
of 62, which excluded Cuba from the OAS, uh, was lifted, as the Secretary of the OAS has told us. Cuba has not requested going back into the organization because this would imply certain commitments. Uh, those who analyze the issues of democracy uh, allege it would be a good thing to have Cuba in the summit of the Americas. Do you think that the Obama administration and President Obama will see that opportunity to discuss democracy, or do you think that he will be opposing it? Like to work or not? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> uh, let me first speak to your democracy point and, and touch on that, then I will speak directly to your point about Cuba and the president. Although I uh, do not hold a formal position in government and I'm not much of a prognosticator of the future. Uh, but the first point on democracy, I think we need to remember that the summit process in and of itself as each of the, our distinguished panelists have said, it is a unique opportunity to bring together heads of state and their uh, leaderships for a dialogue, for discussion. And if you look back to take the drug issue, for one, you can see how that has changed the tone of the debate. Uh, productive integration, a term that you use very eloquently and thoughtfully. Looking back over the summits, these debates and discussions have been shaped, altered because of the dialogue and the discussion at the summits and beyond. But I would also really underscore, while it's easy for us on this panel to focus on hot button issues, and appropriately so, and major issues, the, the real point of any gathering of this type really goes to the accountability issue, which leads to how are you going to improve the lives of people in the countries in the hemisphere. And that is really the bottom line here, of whether it be integration, drug policy, who's included, who's not, the environment, on and on and on. And so when you come to democracy, I think it is uneven throughout the region. I think it is much better now than it was when we had the first summit of the Americas. You asked specifically about the OAS Charter beginning in 1948, and, and another extension was made, I think, to Cuba in 2009 or 2011 by Secretary Clinton. The Quebec summit in 2001 reaffirmed that democratic uh, aspect of participants. So I think it's my understanding that the Panama's uh, distinguished uh, foreign minister and vice president had a very constructive discussion with Secretary Kerry. Invitations have not been extended yet by the host country. Uh, I think uh, the United States has such an investment in this summit process that it will be well represented. And I think likely in the end this will work itself through as it has in past summits to hopefully a satisfactory conclusion. I'm not going to make any predictions about participants, but I have a, a, a overly, uh, not overly, I have a genuinely hopeful feeling that it will move in the right direction. Maybe that's because my hometown is Hope, Arkansas, but I think it will in the end. I'm, I'm hopeful about it. The final th thing I would say about both drugs and integration, uh, I think the, the, the movement and the discussion about drugs has been pretty remarkable. Uh, I remember when President Cardoso, President Cavilla, and President Zedillo talked about this a decade ago. Uh, very different tone and understanding. We now have seen, uh, I think, a real shift in, in the discussion and dialogue. I think that was moved forward by President Santos at the last summit of the Americas. The Obama administration, I think, have tripled the amount of fines to $10 billion on health and prevention and education of drugs. That in and of itself is a landmark change. So I think that is a real shift. In terms of integration, I like your term productive integration. I get it and understand it. But as a business person, I would also say that our world, and Ricky, as you know so well with your financial background, is so interconnected now, where capital and goods flow literally at the snap of a finger. So I think we have to be with that trend in order to help foreign direct investment, not only in the region, but here in our country as well, and in and of itself creating jobs, because that is the way 
uh, you truly improve people's lives. And finally, going back to Cuba, I think the theme of the summit will be well thought out in advance of the summit. I think it's important to frame the summit in the right way and not have, as you said, winners and losers and get off the, the subject. That's a very major undertaking and gathering to, to get off on a subject that, that shouldn't be the, the centerpiece. But I would also say that all the countries need to look very carefully in a very self-evaluation way how are we doing on the rule of law? How strong are our institutions? How do they work? How are human rights working? How is social inclusion working? How is bringing those up from the bottom of the ladder despite the progress that has been made, as Mariana said? How are we doing there? Those are the points that should be focused on for all of the participants there. Uh, and then there will be other subjects uh, uh, such as energy and the environment that will also be discussed. So that's how I truly see the prospects of this summit. Marco Aurelio, eh, la posibilidad entonces de dialogar con Cuba en la cumbre de las... The possibility of discussing with Cuba in the Summit of the Americas opens up the agenda. Do you think there will be a chance to deal with more concrete issues having to do with democracy, but also with human rights, such as prisoners uh, uh, in the case of the island? Or do you think that that could... Um, explode uh, the consensus and the quorum? Is there a possibility to speak candorously with Cuba, or would that rather affect the very development of the summit? Each one can say whatever they want. They, each one can think what they please. But in our case, we do not uh, have an external policy based in uh, intervening in the domestic issues of countries. Oftentimes, we are criticized. They're, we are told that you have a certain tolerance with certain violations here and there. No, what we have is intolerance, absolute intolerance for intervention in domestic affairs. And we deem that there are two methods which might be helpful to all the solution of problems outside. And we must acknowledge and recognize that we also have serious problems inside Brazil. There are serious problems of violation of human rights in my country which we do recognize, we do admit, we try to resolve them, but we have not done so as yet. What are the possible methods? Jose Miguel said one of them very clearly, dialogue. That is what uh, the OAS and UNASUR have attempted. In the case of several crises in the brief history of UNASUR, the crisis, the crisis in Bolivia. Bolivia is on the verge of a partition or a civil war. And that was resolved one afternoon during a meeting in Santiago. That was uh, the way it was done. We had a moment of tremendous tension between Colombia and Venezuela. UNASUR also intervened in that case. Uh, President Kirchner. Uh, governor, uh, the ruler, and other presidents of UNASUR sought out a rapprochement between President Santos and Chavez, which was fundamental. When I publish my memories, if I ever do write them, I will be able to tell you about many other histories and situations where dialogue was basic for the resolution of several instances of high tension, uh, very tense situations in our region. It is clear that dialogue is indeed the best possible pathway, perhaps the only path. The second pathway is to strengthen the economy and the society in the countries. Since poverty, blockade are not factors that contribute in any way to democracy. For example, vis-a-vis -vis Cuba, we have a very clear attitude. We want to help for Cuba to grapple with its economic problems, to deal with them. This is why through the National Development and Social Development Bank of Brazil, we conducted the uh, financing of the port of Mariana, which uh, because we believe that that port will give way to a new history for Cuba, was a history which is very different from the Mariel, the Mariel of some decades uh, back. What uh, would be an advantage of Mariel, which was a very serious problem for Latin America and Cuba and the USA, will now become a great solution, the port of Mariel. So these are indeed the means and the areas where we must make progress. And let me say 
um, something else without asking for diplomacy to become a great academy of sociologists and politologists. I believe that we must be extremely careful in uh, emitting judgment about certain national situations, domestic situations in the region. I do not want to go into the details because uh, as a government official, I must be extremely prudent. But it is self-evident that some processes and the way in our region, which might seem incommensurate, which might seem to be extremely violent at times, are a consequence of changes existing in several countries in extending the public uh, space, as well as the inclusion, or some could say the invasion by other social uh, stakeholders that were margined earlier. And when they participate in politics, and they are not just the subjects thereof who are watching on the margins of history, they do find now institutions which are not uh, good enough for them to be able to express the feeling. It is no surprise that many countries, especially in the DN region, we may have uh, had uh, uh, a constitutional reformulation. Uh, and in other countries with much more stability, radical constitutional issues are coming up, such as in Chile and Brazil, and in other countries very soon as well. So democracy means a process. Democracy is not just a mere objective or a target. It is a process. Let me conclude by s saying, with regard to the uh, relationship of Cuba with the OAS, Cuba, I believe, will not come back to the OAS because they are Marxists. But not from Karl Marx, but Groucho Marx, who says, I do not go into a place if I am not invited to be a guest. So the next round will begin with uh, former President Martin Torrijos. And this has to do with an issue that was put forward by Maria Eva Mejia and Jose Manuel Insulza as to the legalization or not of drugs. Uh, if we're in time to go into that uh, topic, to, to grapple with that new option. Mr. Insulza explained that the struggle against drugs has uh, been going on for a long time. Although there have been improvements, it has not resolved the in-depth problems. There's a new trend of countries now which uh, are requesting that these studies be made to analyze the effectiveness of the war against drugs. And there are others further which have a much more advanced proposal which has to do with legalization, such as the case of President Otto Perez Molina. So uh, in keeping with your analysis vis-a-vis -vis this option, war against drugs, what else could it be? That's another one of the challenges our hemisphere has before it. There's no doubt that the famous war against drugs simply doesn't exist. Not in reality, nor theoretically, as the embargo to Cuba should not exist. I said that before being a president, as president, and as a former president. But going back to the subject of drugs, I think that all countries have made efforts, including regionally, to see how to approach this problem of drugs, which go from positions of legalization to a position where drugs are seen as a problem of public health. And that, and the OAS, as a matter of fact, has done excellent work uh, in that area. And this effort to fight against drug trafficking as well as the consumption of drugs, where we all are parties, because there are no countries that are only producers. All of us participate also in consumption. Our countries are the place from where and into which money comes uh, in, and it co corrupts the social fabric. It allows us and leads us to rethink about this effort made against drug trafficking and organized crime. Now, it is time to see which drugs maybe the today are criminalized, could be decriminalized, or how to see where even though in some countries we 
allow the production of marijuana, then in the, on the other side of the border, this is criminalized and prohibited. So there are inconsistencies, consi inconsistencies excuse me, among drug policies of different countries. So we have to reach agreements. And that's why dialogue, discussion, and regional efforts are important. A dialogue, as Marco Aurelio said, which in some cases have led to an agreement. In one of the summits, I think the differences between Colombia and Ecuador were settled, and in the Rio group. Also, in other cases, we have not had that fortune, that luck. In, for instance, when there was a coup d'etat against President Zelaya in Honduras, and there we were not so successful. But there has been progress in the area of democracy. There has been a new approach towards the problem of drugs. And that approach must be comprehensive and regional at the same time. Since, of course, we have to realize that this is a globalized world where products, licit and legal products, move. So we can't have different policies among neighboring or neighbor countries, because otherwise, the measures taken in one country to tackle the problem of drugs will not be effective. And I do agree that it is a problem of public health instead of one where we should criminalize the consumption of drugs. Colombia has been one of the countries that has been most affected by this war against drugs, especially because of the fact that drug trafficking is truly a motor for organized crime. But if this war does not continue, and Colombian authorities have said that this war has led to great progress, but if we don't do it this way and if you don't legalize drugs, what do you do? What should you do? Well, I think that legalizing, well, no, almost no one, I think, even Guatemala that at one point had thought of it, I don't think anybody has spoken about legalizing drugs or eliminating the three conventions of the OAS, not even the document that will be coming out on Tuesday on, by the Global Commission on Drugs Policy. They're nowhere that is coordinated by President Cardoso. Nowhere do they speak about touching these conventions and uh, the regulatory frameworks, which are a minimum. No one here will stop fighting against organized crime, laundering of assets. We need very clear legislation in that area. At the same time, it's been interested to, interesting to share experiences. For instance, the US experience that Roberto mentioned yesterday when he spoke about the law enforcement judges that deal exclusively with the criminalization or non-criminalization or criminal alternative of drugs. President Santos, on uh, the 25th anniversary of the murder of Luis Carlos Galan, 10 days ago, said that when Galan's, Juan Manuel Galan's son as a senator committed himself to submitting a draft bill to Congress aiming at allowing the use, the medicinal use of cannabis and to submit a bill of that type in Colombia with everything that entails with historic weight, where the son of Luis Carlos Galán murdered by the head of the Medellin cartel, this criminal who did so much harm in the world. For him to open a path towards a public health approach, maybe, or a procedure which will be, which is expensive for all our countries and where the youth is somewhat lost. So I think whether in the United States, in Colombia, or in Medellin, this is something to be taken into account. We're not speaking about legalize, legalizing it. We have to apply justice, and we have to strengthen it. We have to enforce justice, but we have to strengthen common mechanisms. Jose Miguel may tell us what will come after the approval by the foreign ministers of the hemisphere, including the United States, Canada, and all the countries of the hemisphere, where they will be adopting this new resolution, which will open the doors for a new road, not only based on rhetoric, but on the legal and international reality. And that has made this whole process very interesting. And I trust that this will contribute. I think President Calderon spoke about that yesterday when he spoke about the 
security indexes in our region, which are dramatically low. And we're in Medellin. They have begun some small experiments which will allow for certain regional experiences to see what works. For instance, Uruguay has what they done worked or not, or the two states in the United States. So there's a study on security on people under 17 committing crimes, and this linked to the consumption of drugs. So if you're going to prevent a young person from killing somebody else to steal a cellular phone, and if this is study is linked to the drug study, we have to consider that. There are still, there's still drug traffic and there's still organized crime. There's still laundering of assets. But what can a country as Colombia do when it sees that one of the five points of negotiation with the FARC is the subject of illicit drugs and drug trafficking? So it's a commitment towards rural Colombia for crop substitution. And I think a lot of progress has been made in the area. Ambassador Villegas, who was one of the negotiators, is aware of this. And we are aware of that. That is how to work with the rural areas. How would the peace process benefit in the rural area if we find a solution to this problem? Is a change in the anti-drug policy viable in, in the relationship between the United States and Latin America in fighting drugs but in a different way? Is that viable and possible? I think it is, and I think you're already seeing that. I think we're in the middle uh, of a pretty remarkable change. Uh, it's not complete. It probably shouldn't be. I, I think the New York Times it not only came out from an editorial standpoint, uh, speaking to the drug issue and uh, legalizing certain drugs, but they had a series of very depthful follow-ups. That, that's a pretty major sea change in our country when you have uh, a respected uh, newspaper like that. I think, secondly, when you talk about legalization, you know, I don't know whether we have anyone here from Colorado or Washington State, but you could discuss that here in the United States as, as well. But I would underscore, I think there's already been a change of mindset. And so I think there's been a change in how the United States relates to the region from several years ago. It's still a very serious issue, both from a health standpoint, which we were talking about it, just like we did cigarettes and alcohol and other things in that context, but also from a, a crime standpoint, and, and Master Mejia made that point, we've got to be very resolute in that. But the truth is, at least in my judgment, as the head of President Obama's drug uh, efforts has said, you can't arrest yourself out of this Nothing policy. You can't do it. You've got to attack it other ways in a very creative, resolute way. And I think we're in the process of doing that. So the answer is, I think, yes, but it will take some time. It will be in steps. María Emma dijo algo muy importante, y es que la retórica y hay que pasar hechos concretos. ¿Cuál es el siguiente paso? Bueno, yo creo que eh, hay hechos concretos, o sea, eh, lo han hecho más recién. Yo creo que es cierto que prestamos mucha atención además a... I think it is true that we paid attention to Colorado and Washington here, and let us not forget that Secretary Holder has spoke about a broad policy of releasing people who have been arrested for small drug crimes, and this will be significant. Also, we have to see how we distribute the budget funds to see that the money that goes for prevention is now increasing. All of this information is important, and all countries' efforts are being made. And I personally am in favor of ensuring that efforts continue being made and that we continue promoting this and continue reporting on results. I think that we cannot make this only part of a resolution by international organization, although diplomats only sign resolutions when things are already well uh, known and they don't want to run risks. But we are in a good path, and we will be holding a meeting in Guatemala. Maria Emma mentioned that. We're now on the right path, I think, and we have to work 
basically uh, in four areas. First of all, drug as a problem of public health. Out of the Latin American countries, the one, well, I'm not going to compare them, but the one that has the greatest coverage for the treatment for drug addiction is only at a level of 25 or 26 percent. That's why maybe they're putting people in prison because they don't know how to deal with them so or how to treat them. So it's a question of public health. And if we don't deal with it with that approach, we won't solve the problem. Some friends are in favor of full legalization of drugs. And uh, what I'm talking about is just a middle solution. But alternatives are important. Yes. It's not the same thing to be sentenced for small trafficking and to be sentenced to working in community service in an old age home than being sent to prison. So these are different types of penalties. So many countries are working, establishing drug courts as well as alternative penalties. And I think that is important. Another path to go back to what Martin was saying, if I remember correctly. This does not mean that we should not fight against organized uh, crime, because that is essential, as well as strengthening institutions. Sometimes we forget uh, in the OES that we need to reach the conclusion that the less institutionality, the more crime. We have to realize that. There are some countries in which the problem in institutionality is what has led to more crime. Because the risk of being sentenced for a crime, be it drug trafficking or another, is much smaller if there's no institutionality. Um, the Nobel Prize of Economics, I don't remember who it was, but I remember that he said that that is a scientific truth. The problem is not the amount of sen sentencing or the certainty of sentencing. In other words, if institutions don't work, we can apply any penalty we wish, but we won't get anywhere without institutions. So this subject, fight against drug, organized drug, organized crime, excuse me, and these drug courts, as well as institutionality, all of this is something that has been taken into account, should be taken into account. Since Brazil has been taken a leadership role in this area, can you conclude our discussion on the subject? I would like to draw your attention to two things. First of all, I think that what Maria Emma mentioned here is very important, i.e., that there was a point of inflection in Colombia in that they decided to confront the problem of the guerrilla a country in which there was a huge insurgency that had lasted 40 years or more, or 50 years. And that had dual implications. First of all, regarding citizen coexistence, it was a divided country. And that even had huge implications vis-a-vis -vis the presence of Colombia in the world in general. I think that in the first discussion we had in Brazil with, with Mr. Santos when he was still a candidate to presidency, that was quite clear. In approaching the subject of the guerrilla with all of its implications vis-a-vis -vis drugs, and not only from the military point of view, but mainly from the political point of view, the government truly made a great contribution in ensuring that that subject be settled. Other countries, including some where former leaders think they're the center of the world, tried to solve the problem by manu militare, by military means. I don't think that was a good solution. Now, in the case of Brazil, I can speak with a certain experience, not because I'm a drug consumer. The only drug I use is wine, but because my son is one of the leaders of the National Anti-Drug Service. He's a psychiatrist who is so involved in this subject that he's slowly becoming a sociologist. 
and he has reached a conclusion which is not so difficult to reach, and that is that the drug problem in Brazil, and I think that it's the same in other countries, is a problem that is directly linked to poverty. To poverty. This does not mean that if we eliminate poverty, we will also solve the problem of drugs. But if we solve the problem of drugs as a criminal issue, that may help. There's, of course, border control, arms control, because we speak a lot about drugs, but not about weapons, about arms. Drugs often are used as a currency to buy arms. So I think that we are making progress up to, no, up to, to a point where the problem of drugs will be such a, a problem the same as alcohol is, which is a problem, but that can be solved in other ways. So the problem of cigarettes, which is also a problem. The problem of tobacco can also be solved with other ways. I'm not saying that people should go out to go and consume drugs out here, but I do think that it should be decriminalized. And I think that that is the essential question. Of course, it won't be easy because it is also a, something that involves cultural values, religious values. But I do think that in the area of a democratic or in the context of a democratic discussion, discussion we will make progress. And we have to be very open-minded towards the different experiences that are being attempted without trying to either copy them or putting a stop to them. Thank you very much, Marco Aurelio, Martin, Maria Emma, Mark, and Jose Miguel Insulza for this discussion. We have to go to the next panel now and see you at the next Summit of the Americas.